Okay. Shalom, everyone, and welcome to the special, the special class uh, in commemoration of Kristallnacht, which is now celebrating its 82nd year. We're commemorating the 82nd year since Kristallnacht. Uh, and um, we're going to be studying the background, the context, and uh, the event itself. And this is called the German Jewish response to the rise of Nazism. Let's begin. First, let's establish some context. Following World War I, towards the end of 1918, Germany was beaten and humiliated. The Democratic Republic that emerged at the end of the war was forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles, which imposed compensation payments along with military and political restrictions, while placing the majority of the blame for the war on Germany. Right-wing groups insinuated that the defeat was caused due to internal treachery and the Republic became identified with national failure and Germany's enemies. The Republic recognized human and civil rights and, for the first time, Germany's Jews received full equality. Many of them were involved in commerce and others integrated into society and assimilated into economic, scientific, cultural and governmental roles. Moreover, Germany experienced significant cultural prosperity in many fields. However, the Republic faced numerous difficulties, which weakened its power. Many of its officials had reservations about the democratic regime and aspired to revert to the old monarchic rule. These years saw several coup attempts and acts, political terror, including the murder of Walter Rathenau, the foreign affairs minister, and Hitler's putsch in 1923. The economic crisis that befell Germany, mainly after 1929, destabilized it and brought on a sense of despair. The Republic eventually met its demise following Hitler's appointment to Chancellor of Germany by President Hindenburg in January of 1933. So this is an interesting film for a couple of reasons. First of all, right, we have to remember whom we're talking about, the Germans. The Germans were a very uh, regimented people. They had a concept of ordnung. They liked things orderly and neat and in order. And when they made war, they prided themselves on the fact that they were, they could march well and they could fight with, with precisions and that their discipline, their personal human discipline would serve them well in war. And here, after World War I, they lost the war. So there was a tremendous sense of frustration. They didn't know how they could lose the war. And even more, they not only lost the war, but they lost the war to the, the East, to the Russians, to the French, to peoples who they felt were not as disciplined as them and who they didn't understand. How it could be that the great German culture and personality and soldier could have lost the war. So they attributed it immediately to an, an, an insidious internal uprising, a dolschluss, a stabbing in the back, that they blamed, a lot of people blamed the Jews. That's one part of the post-war 1919 to 33 reality in Germany. The second was the trial. Now that the Kaiser had abdicated and run away after the failure of, world, of winning the war in World War I, Germany at attempted to establish one of the most advanced democracies history has ever known. The Weimar Republic was, if you read the Constitution of the Weimar Republic, it is a masterpiece of human dignity, of civil rights, of opportunity. And they tried to establish this type of government in a place where they were used to a much more regimented, authoritarian, authoritarian right, autocratic form of government. And that they, they didn't have a lot of time to adapt it, and that caused a great deal of confusion. That's what it was when you saw in the film. There were protests in the street and, and anarchy in a certain extent, and, and, and there was at one point after the crash, after the crash of Wall Street in, in 1929, there was a, a tremendous uh, uh, financial flux, a, 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 a failing of, of the economy in Germany. My grandmother used to tell me that she would go to work and pass by the bakery and a loaf of bread would be a million Deutsches Mark. And then when she would come back from work, it would be three million. 
the, there was deflation, there was depression in the sense that, that they, they didn't know what hit them. And again, it caused great flux and anxiety within society. Now, while all that was being said, there still was the personal reality of life in Germany. So here you have the story, here you have a picture that tells the story of a particular family from Berlin, the Kindermann family. It's approximately, this was taken approximately 1927. So granted, before the Great Depression hit Germany, right? And it was a typical German Jewish family, but let's take a look at it. First of all, it's not typical to me. This is my family. If you look up in the corner, you see here my grandmother, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my great-grandmother, another great-grandmother, another great-grandfather, my aunts, my uncles. This is my family. And they lived in Germany. We can determine quite a bit about them just from this picture. First of all, you see they were quite well-dressed. Many of them were wearing uh, tuxedos, right, for evening wear. They, they had maids, right? Here you see this was a maid and a cook and uh, 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 someone who took care of the children. You had uh, wallpaper, right? Electricity without wires all over the place. You had uh, nice pictures on the wall. All in all, it was, this is a picture of a middle-class family that lived in, in Berlin, a Jewish family. And it wasn't just inside. There was also, as a whole, the, even though there was great flux in the community in general, there was, the Jewish community was an established community. For example, here you have a couple of things that are of great interest. First of all, in the top left-hand corner, you have a newspaper from the Association for the Defense of Anti-Semitism. It, it, it's interesting to note that they had a whole newspaper that dealt with anti-Semitism. There was anti-Semitism in Germany in Germany prior to the Nazis. The Nazis didn't bring anti-Semitism to Germany, but they, and, they, and, and the anti-Semitism was quite vocal at times, but the Jews felt secure enough to express an opinion, to fight back. Here you have a very famous full page ad taken in a newspaper, right? On the Deutschen Mutter, right? The, uh, speaking to the German mothers, who's sitting and crying? A Jewish mother. There was 100,000 Jewish men and boys that fought for Germany in World War I. 12,000, more than 10% died. They died for their country. And this is an ad saying, German mothers, we, the Jewish mothers, <coughs> we know what you're going through. We too experienced that pain because we are part and parcel of Germany. Even though we're Jewish, we are also German. <coughs> Lastly, you see down here at anti anti. Tatsachen zu Judenfrage, right? Answers to the Jewish question. This is sort of a cute thing that was put out by this association for the defense of anti Semitism. What was it? <coughs> it was a, a deck of cards, if you will, that you would carry around in your pocket. Let's say you were riding on the train and you heard someone sitting across from you say something anti-Semitic. All the, the Jews own all the stores in, 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 in Germany. Or the, the Jews didn't fight and were. So what could you do? You could take out your deck of cards and flip through them and find the card that had the, the issue that they were talking about, the Jews, Jewish owned business. You could flip it over and now you would get the fact. This was an attempt to fight fiction with fact. Now, all of these three issues have something in common. These are the affectations of a community that feels quite at home. The German Jewish community between the wars, even though there was anti Semitism, felt at home. They felt at home to the extent that they could fight anti Semitism with full page ads with cute gimmicks, a deck of cards, with an entire newspaper, right? They were part of the central committee 
It was like a, a large organized committee of German of the German Jewish population. They had 80,000 members. 80,000 members out of a total population of approximately 360,000 Jews in Germany between the wars is an outstanding percentage of active members in the Jewish community. 600 local sections, 50 regional federations, over 100 full-time administration employees. And what did they do? They did judicial judicial activism, right? They, uh, they would sue people if they got out of line. Statistical research, documentation on anti-Semitic groups and individuals, fighting anti-Jewish propaganda, promotion of the Jewish contribution to the country, denunciation of anti-Semitism, a danger to society as a whole. If I cover up the German words, it sounds a lot like uh, a, a local federation or perhaps, perhaps the Anti-Defamation League. Right or the 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 act the social action committees of of our 21st century Jewish communal institutions, and we just as we feel pretty much at home in Australia or in the United States, right? We feel they, the Jewish community feels pretty much at home that they feel that it's their right as citizens of Australia or as citizens of South America or the United States, it's their right to fight anti-Semitism because they are legitimate citizens of the state. Much of that changed while administering and applying one of the most important tools of a modern state and that's democracy. Democracy is what defends us. Those of you who are are paying attention and watching what's going on in the United States, whatever your political perspective might be, you're seeing democracy in action. You're seeing people voting and others grappling with their votes and those who are happy voting for and those who are unhappy voting against. And that is a protection within society. That is something that can keep us secure because even if we find ourselves in a situation where we disagree or we don't want or don't like the present government, we know that we will have the opportunity to express our voice in the future and possibly change it. If we can garner support amongst the population, we can change the government. And that's what happened on January 30th, 1933. Here you have a picture, a famous picture of Adolf Hitler, the head of the Nazis, exercising his right as a free German citizen in Weimar and voting, no doubt for himself. And you see that he was uh, popular. You see uh, people saluting him on the day of his victory. And it was his party, the Nazi party, was legitimately elected into the, the German government, the Reichstag. And unlike the government, let's say, in the United States, and I apologize, I'm less familiar with the government of Australia, but like in Israel, right, you voted for a party, and a party came in, and parties would negotiate with each other in order to create a majority in Israel's case in the Knesset, or in Germany's case in the Reichstag, right, and a, a majority, and they would rule. And that's what happened. Hitler got in a significant uh, uh, percentage of the vote, not the majority, but he was able to maneuver and make arrangements with other political groups so that he had power. Remember the date, January 30th, 1933, because less than one month later, that secure pillar of German democracy, of all our democracies, that changed. February 27th, 1933, the Reichstag, which is the picture you see, the symbol and the building of German democracy, the Knesset, the Congress, Parliament, was set aflame. At the time, the Nazis accused the communists. It's a communist plot to overthrow the government. Today, we know, historians have told us, that it was the Nazis themselves that set this flame. But at the time, Hitler created a pretext for declaring martial law. Now, just uh, so we're all on the same page, what is martial law? Martial law is the temporary suspension of civil rights for the 
immediate good of society. In the case of February 27th, 1933, Hitler said, we're under attack. The communists are attacking the very foundations of German democracy. Therefore, in order for us to protect our way of life, we are going to declare martial law so that we are able to suspend civil rights and arrest people, perhaps without due process, jail them without a trial, and other such forms of, of what they would call security precautionary, uh, um, precautionary steps to secure the safety of society. Has that happened since? Yeah, it happens all the time. For example, on a much different scale, but philosophically and conceptually the same. In Israel, we are now just coming out of lockdown because of the pandemic. And in Israel, there was a gigantic discussion. Should they not allow protests, government protests against the government, right, during the pandemic? Because people would get together, they wouldn't be careful, and perhaps that would spread the disease. On the other hand, there was a civil right involved. And Israel didn't want to tamper with the basic civil rights of a citizen. And it was a huge discussion. Should they establish a type of martial law and prohibit uh, uh, protests? So it's, a, it's an issue that exists today. And on February 27th, Hitler established martial law because of the burning of the Reichstag, which he claimed was a communist attack. But there were ramifications. It wasn't just that. I was a little child, just like normal children living in an apartment. I had no idea what, what Hitler is. There were not many Jewish people in Germany. Very few, actually, 300,000 in the whole country of 60 million. Uh, so, in, in other words, we didn't know what it was Jewish, except that we went to synagogue or went to Jewish school or something like that. And there was, as far as I knew, very little anti-Semitism at that time. In 1933, Hitler came into power. Now, my dad used to be in the insurance business, selling insurance. And one day I found out that he couldn't sell insurance anymore. Later I found out that the German government went to the insurance company and uh, induced them to fire the people who were Jewish, which was he. And suddenly he was not an agent anymore and basically was out of work. And that's the first time I really uh, understood something that might affect me. So it wasn't just that Hitler declared uh, martial law. But as one of the planks of the Nazi party, one of the, the pillars of their party upon which people voted, they knew this is what they're getting, was overt anti-Semitism. At this point in time, it was anti-Semitism to disengage the Jews from German society. They just didn't want Jews around. They didn't want Jews involved in the economy. They didn't want Jews as a regular, equal member of society. And so pressure began to be applied quietly at first, behind the scenes, just letting you know that as long as you have Jewish employees, you're not going to get business from us, nor will we encourage our people to do business with you. As a matter of fact, we'll discourage it. On April, you see it's going in, in almost monthly, monthly waves of, of attack. The Germans are now putting into place the foundations of what will become their, their ever-growing anti-Semitic governmental policies. On April 1st, 1933, a Saturday, the Nazis declared a boycott of Jewish business. It was originally supposed to be seven days. It wasn't seven days. And it's an, it was interesting because it really had no effect on the economy, on the finances of the Jews boycotted. However, 
it, it, it does have very great significance. I'd like to point it out to you. If you look here in the pictures that are in front of you, you'll see on your far left, the Nazi in standing in front of a, a store and there's a Jewish star painted on, on a, uh, a showcase. There's a sign in German telling Jews not, or telling Germans not to buy in German, in Jewish stores. Now, if you go to the other side of the pictures, you see the same thing. You see a, a poster pasted on a window, Germans don't buy by Jews. And here you have a department store, they wrote you the Jew on the windows. But in the middle, you see something very interesting. You see not only the sign, the upper part of the sign in German, but the lower part of the sign was in English. Now, you have to ask yourself, why is that? Was it they were trying to warn tourists from the United States or from Britain not to shop in Jewish stores? Unlikely. But rather, the Nazis were sending a message. What happened? When the Nazi power, when the Nazi party came to power, again, they had a plank that was obvious to all that they didn't like Jews. They didn't want Jews involved. They didn't want Jews owning businesses. They didn't want Jews in society. Well, when the Americans read their newspaper and read about this plank, they were enraged and they called for a boycott. The second Americans American Jews called on America in general to boycott German products, all the memories, right? All the memories of the depression, of financial distress, of the, of, of the great suffering that the population had came to the fore and the Nazis played on it. And the Nazis said, international Jewry is once again trying to sink the, the German economy. And they said, however, how will we deal with that? We let the Jews know we will not succumb to international Jewry, international Jewish financial pressure. You boycott us, we will boycott you. And while their boycott, their 24-hour boycott, was not successful financially, it was quite successful socially. And in fact, the Jewish German community sent a cable to Stephen Weiss in the United States, who was the titular head of the American Jewish community, begging him to call off the boycott. Call off the boycott of German products because it's hurting, not helping. Now, how did the Jews, how did the Jews begin to respond? Well, the first response, and we'll see this graph a little later, was that they emigrated. 37,000 Jews. There was a total population of 360,000 Jews in Germany, a little over 10% of the entire Jewish population of Germany left. They got out. That's not insignificant. That's not, not doing anything. That's a significant uh, emigration from Nazi Germany by Jews as a first response 10%, a little over 10% left. What about the 90% that didn't leave? Again, they felt very at home, so they decided they would fight. What does that mean that they would fight? They would fight the way civilized people, citizens in a community who disagree with each other, who don't like what the other is doing, fight. They fought for popular opinion. They fought in order to influence society. One of the ways they did that, initially was through the press. There was a, a, a lot of Jewish newspapers. One of the most famous was the Yudhische Rundschau. It still exists today. If you have a German Jewish home with a native German speaker, you have a copy. My father has a copy of the Yudhische Rundschau in his house. You go there and you, you sit and you read the German, what's going on in Germany and around the world. It's a very popular Jewish German paper. One of the most famous of its uh, authors, one of the most famous of its of its um, of the people who write for the paper, the the authors was a man named Robert Welch, and he wrote a very very famous piece. Right, carry the yellow mark with pride. Now it was a piece that that hearkened to a previous time where Jews were forced to wear marks on their clothes. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the, the stars that, that existed. You see the yellow star that they painted, right? 
but he says, don't allow yourselves to be cowards. The, the boycott leadership gave orders that a sign with a yellow mark was to be pasted on the boycotted shop. This regulation is intended as a brand, as a sign of contempt, like those symbols of long ago. We will not, we will take it up and make it a badge of honor. How we view ourselves and the pride in which we have in ourselves can be reflected to others. And we won't let them mark us as untermenschen, as subhuman, you, not using the term as the Nazis used it in a scientific way, but using it as a social way, people who are not fit to be part of society. We will mark it as a badge of honor. We're Jews and proud Germans. Many Jews suffered a crushing experience on Saturday. Suddenly they were revealed as Jews. The patriots, the Nazis, moved from house to house, stuck their placards on shops and signboards, daubed the windows, and for 24 hours, the German Jews were exhibited in the stocks, so to speak. You're different. Jews, he says, take it up, the Star of David, and wear it with pride. There is no shame for any German to also be a Jew. And that was, that was an attempt to fight the policies of the Nazis, a civilized attempt, a, a, attempt by a community that felt very at home in their country. How did the Nazis respond? Well, again, a month later, a little, uh, 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 really a week later to begin with, right? April 1st was the boycott, April 7th. The Jews were banned from working in civil service to practice the law. If you were a Jewish attorney, you were kicked out of the, 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 the bar association and you couldn't practice law. You couldn't defend people, you, right? You couldn't, you couldn't pursue civil, civil suits in court. You were, you were no longer allowed to be a Jewish lawyer. You were no longer allowed to be a Jewish civil servant if you were a, 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 a mailman or if you worked in, in the post office in the offices or if you were a clerk in some government office you lost your job. At the end of April, three weeks later, quotas are introduced limiting the number of Jewish students admitted to high schools and university to 1.5%, which is how the Nazis figured, it's a little bit exaggerated, but how the Nazis figured the Jewish percentage of the population in Germany. So what do you have here? You have uh, an overt overt steps taken by the Nazis to remove Jews from society. They couldn't work for society anymore. They couldn't defend or pursue their rights under the law anymore, nor could they be educated in schools where the percentage of the Jewish population in the school exceeded the percentage of the Jewish population in the country. If you were in a small German community, so it might not have, this law might not have affected you at all. But if you were in a big community, Berlin, Frankfurt, Hamburg, right? So then if you were in a school with a, a big Jewish community, you were out of school. Your kids were out of school. How did the Jewish community respond? Well, first, let's speak about the individual personal impact. I think we felt it, we children felt it more acutely because of the harassment that we received almost on a daily basis in school and on the street and uh, on, a, on a different level than the parents. The parents thought initially that this would blow over, you see, until more and more laws, where the Nuremberg laws and other laws were introduced, which made it more difficult. We couldn't have the same maid in the household anymore. We couldn't buy in certain stores any we couldn't go to a swimming pool anymore we couldn't go into parks anymore when all of these laws were introduced uh, we really felt it more and more year after year here you have a, a personal testimony about a child who was driven from his school how did the jewish community as a whole begin to respond well one of their their most significant responses was as a result of the nazis changing the structure of society in germany what was that Prior to the war, in between the wars, each community, Hamburg, Berlin, different communities in Berlin, uh, 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 Frankfurt, different communities, they all had individual Jewish federations 
who collected taxes from the Jews, Jewish community, paid the taxes to the government, and the government in turn would support and pay for in many instances, or pay part of the needs of the community. If you needed a new synagogue, if there was a community center being built, if the old synagogue needed repairs, that money came from taxes paid to the government. And each Jewish federation dealt with the government. When the Nazis came to power, the last thing they wanted was Jews from across the country petitioning and calling on the government for favors, for, for needs. So they, they disbanded the, all these individual federations and they made a federation for the country called the Reich Representation of German Jews. Later, its name will change to the Reich Representation of Jews in Germany. But at this point in time, September 29th, 1933, the German Jews felt German. They were German and Jews, even if the government was changing the rules on the ground. They still had a sense of pride in being German. So the Nazis created this central representation for German Jews, and they chose to head it. They forced into taking the positions as leaders of two of the most distinguished German Jews of the 20th century. Rabbi Leo Beck, who was, if you will, a he was a moral beacon to the world. He represented the best of Judaism in his, in his dignity, in his sensitivity, in his care for the other. He was world famous leader not only of the Jewish community, but anywhere people strive for morals and ethics, the name Leo Beck was revered. And Leo Beck was a rabbi, he was a member of the clergy. His counterpart among the lay leadership was Otto Hirsch, a gem of a human being, a, a as we say, a bald tzedakah, someone who gave charity with an open hand and an open heart and an organizer and people who truly, a man who truly cared for not only the Jewish community, but others. These two men became the leaders of the Jewish community as far as the German government was concerned. And Leo Beck writes at a time that is as hard and difficult as any in Jewish history, but also significant as few times have been. We have been entrusted with the leadership and representation of the German Jews. There are new duties in Jewish education. New areas of Jewish schooling must be created in order that the rising generation may find spiritual strength, inner resistance, and physical competence. And he was joined in his holy endeavor by another world famous Jew, um, uh, uh, the, the philosopher Martin Buber. And Martin Buber was in task, in task, he was tasked with creating adult education amongst people who were largely assimilated. And, he, and, and Martin Buber wrote, the issue is no longer to be equipped with knowledge, but mobilization for existence. Persons, Jewish persons are to be formed. Persons who will not only hold out, but will uphold some substance in life, who will not have only morale, but moral strength and so will be able to pass on moral strength to others. Persons who live in such a way that the spark will not die because our concern for the spark, we work for education. What we seek to do through the education of individuals is the building of a community that will stand firm, that will prevail, that will preserve the spark. What spark is he talking about? The, the Judeo-Christian ethic, the moral code of society today that was given birth in the womb of the Jewish people. And he said, to the, they said in public to the overall Jew, German community, you may exclude us, but understand, we will show you what it is to be a real German, a Jewish German, a moral, ethical, upstanding, healthy, socially active person. And we will be the best Jews that we can be. And we will best be the best Germans, and there might not be a difference between the two. That was the German Jewish stance in 1933-34. How did the Nazis respond? Well, 
It was a massive body blow. In September of 1935, the Nazis instituted the Nuremberg Laws, which simply put meant that Jews could no longer be citizens. There were no more German Jews. There might be Jews in Germany, but there were no more German Jews because Jews could no longer be German. They, no, they, were, they were legal aliens. And these laws not only stripped the Jews of their civil rights, but they also entered into three areas that the law became now a palatable present. You see, the first is the bedroom. This is a picture of a husband and wife. It's a posed picture clearly, right? And they pick these people because the husband is a stereotypical Jew, short, big nose, large ears, dark hair, ruddy complexion. And the woman, his wife, is a typical Aryan, tall, blonde haired, blue eyed. And she's carrying a vile sign that brings into question her, her moral existence or her human qualities that she is, sleeps with an animal. And he is carrying a sign that identifies himself as a lecher, as someone who goes after Aryan women. So now all of a sudden, the private love lives, the private relationships that exist between human beings was now a matter of government policy. The second area that these laws intruded upon where they might not have existed in such predominant, uh, without such a presence before, was in the world of education. Not education just on what you're taught, but education as a way of promoting values and ethics within society. And the Nazis said to the young people on the university, he said, that, the Nazis said, the time has come for you, the young people, to define a new way. No longer should you be bound by the old Jew, Jewish traditions. No longer should you be limited. No longer should your choices be determined by a ethic that you no longer believe. You're young, you're strong. And it's you who should run society, not the weak, not the elderly, not the sick. All those are ethics that belong not to us but to, to a, a Jewish infected society. And so they burnt books. They made a symbolic stand to burn the symbols of knowledge. And students participated. They participated in mass and with enthusiasm because there's something exciting about being able to reestablish society in your own image. You found something similar. Not, we won't discuss it in this class, but perhaps in another class. In the T4 project, you had significant, if not the vast majority of the medical community agreeing with a significant part of Nazi ideology. The idea of uh, uh, euthanasia, the idea of uh, social Darwinism, the idea that medicine could, by getting rid of the weak link, change society. And that, in fact, is the third area that Nazis, and the, that the Nuremberg's infected. They, they, they politicized medicine, certainly in the way we just discussed amongst the T4, amongst how the doctors were willing to perform terrible medical experiments for social ends. But in terms of how you view anti-Semitism. The Jew is a biological disease that afflicts society. And this idea, by the way, not so much about the Jew per se, but about people in general was not a Nazi invention. It existed in the, in, even in the United States, right? Uh, up until last week, there was university program in Arizona that supported the study of, come on, what's the word? Uh, it just popped out of my head because I'm getting old. The study of how um, uh, genetics impact society. 
Okay, by the end of the presentation, I'm sure it'll pop in my head. And, but here you have an example. You have a Nazi using what looks like a medical um, uh, tool to, to determine is this man's nose a Jewish nose, right? And underneath it, you have that impact, right? Dogs and Jews cannot enter, right? And the, the, the article in the New York Times, the Reich places Jews back in the Middle Ages, the Nuremberg Law. But that was not the worst of it. It impacted people. We can never forget. It started in 1933, people. really. But I had very good friends of whom I knew that they were members of the Nazi party since 1928. And she was one of my best friends. She didn't care that I was Jewish and I didn't care that she was a Nazi. She was one of my sports friends and we got along very well. But then, of course, in 1933, everything changed. Like, overnight, you could not go into a, a public place. No restaurants, no swimming pools, no movies, n nothing. You couldn't, you, you were not allowed in any public place anymore. And uh, the people that you knew wouldn't talk to you anymore. Friends that you had, they would shun you, most of them. Uh, not because they hated us all of a sudden, but they were all afraid because that was, that was the way it was. You talk to a Jew and you'll be punished. It was very hard. I was 19 years old and all of a sudden I was shut off from everything. I got a letter from my sports club in Ulm that I wasn't welcome there anymore because I was Jewish. And that, would, that, that was the thing that I loved to do most, as I said before, sports. And all of a sudden that was finished. There was nothing I could do. We just were really vegetating, if you want to call it that. So. So this is Margaret Lambert, who was an uh, a Olympic athlete in the high jump. And she was one of the world, she was a holder of a world of world records. And the there's a, I believe there's a movie out about her now, or is coming out about her, but her story is fascinating. She ended up, after Kristallnacht, running away from Germany. She went to England. The Germans arrested her parents. And the, this was all happening at the same time that the United States was threatening a boycott of the Olympics in Berlin because of Nazi racial theories. And the Nazis wanted to, if the Americans wouldn't participate, there would be no real Olympics. So they wanted the Americans to participate and they threatened Lampert, this woman, with the lives of her parents unless she came back to be an official member of the German Olympic team. She did, though she did not compete, nor was she allowed to practice with them, nor was she even allowed to go into the changing rooms and, and change into her athletic clothing with them. But she was officially on the, on the roster of athletes, which was at the point that it came out, which was after the Americans already set sail, was enough to mollify the United States. Again, it's a very interesting story. By the way, the, the word that I was looking for that had jumped out of my mind, thank goodness jumped in. I'm talking about eugenics, the study of eugenics, which is a, was a major field of study in the United States that focused in on how genes and biology impacted human behavior. How did the Jews respond to all these massive changes? Well, they continued about, though in a much more active and, 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 and uh, active way to continue that we will be the best Germans we can be and we will pursue all of our values. If you don't want us to do it within the framework of German society, we'll do it on our own. So they established the Association of Jewish Cultural Societies and they had operas and they had symphony and they had sports activities, right? And the, right, the Kulturbund Deutsche Juden, that's a ticket, how to get you know, to one of the activities. This orchestra was one of the finest in Europe, but it wasn't playing in a hall. It was playing in a synagogue because Jews weren't allowed to go to, but they had it. And they said, look, we are every bit as civilized 
as you are. So you don't want us to be part? Fine. We'll be a society within a society. Jews establish their own educational programs. I mean, they're kicked out of schools. Not only Jewish study, but Zionism, but mathematics, by languages. Here you see a picture of Martin Buber in his adult education class that we spoke about earlier. They didn't allow themselves to sit at home and not be educated. If they couldn't go to the German schools, they would establish Jewish schools in Germany. But then things changed. Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, was the wave of violent anti-Jewish pogroms on November 9th and 10th of 1938. It took place throughout Germany, annexed Austria, and in areas of Czechoslovakia recently occupied by German troops. Kristallnacht owes its name to the shards of shattered glass from the windows of synagogues, homes, and Jewish-owned businesses that lined German streets in the wake of the pogrom. On November 7, 1938, Ernst von Raff, a German embassy official stationed in Paris, was assassinated by Herschel Grimspan, a 17-year-old Polish Jew living illegally in Paris. Grimspan revengefully shot the diplomat after witnessing the expulsion of not only his parents, but thousands of Jews of Polish citizenship living in the German Reich. Von Raff died on November 9, 1938. The same day, at a meeting of Nazi party leadership, Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels, a chief instigator of the Kristallnacht pogroms, suggested that world Jewry had conspired to commit the assassination and ordered that any demonstration while not organized by the Nazi party shall not be hampered. Newspapers reported otherwise. After Goebbels' speech, violence erupted in various parts of the Reich. Paramilitary, or SA, and Hitler Youth Units throughout Germany and its annexed territories destroyed Jewish-owned homes and businesses. Jewish artifacts were confiscated, and many young, healthy Jewish men were arrested and filled local jails. The rioters destroyed 267 synagogues throughout Germany, Austria, and the Sudetenland. Many synagogues burned throughout the night in full view of public and of local firefighters who had received orders to intervene only to prevent flames from spreading to nearby buildings. SA and Hitler Youth members shattered shop windows of an estimated 7,500 Jewish-owned commercial establishments and looted their wares. Jewish cemeteries became a particular object of desecration in many regions. Mobs of SA men roamed the streets, attacking Jews in their houses and forcing Jews they encountered to perform acts of public humiliation. Kristallnacht claimed the lives of at least 91 Jews. As the pogrom spread, units of the SS and Gestapo, the secret state police, arrested up to 30,000 Jewish males and transferred most of them from local prisons to Dachau and Buchenwald, as well as other concentration camps. In the immediate aftermath of the pogrom, measures were introduced to eliminate Jews and perceived Jewish influence from the German economic sphere. The German government announced that the Jews were to blame for the pogrom imposing a fine of 400 million U.S. dollars on the German Jewish community. German education officials expelled Jewish children still attending German schools. The German government announced laws that enforced Aryanization policy, the transfer of Jewish-owned enterprises and property to the Aryan ownership. The events of Kristallnacht represented one of the most important turning points in Nazi anti-Semitic policy. The Nazi regime moved eventually towards policies of forced immigration and finally toward the realization of a Germany free of Jews 
by deportation of the Jewish population to the East. This was a change. This was no longer the anti civilized anti Semitism that existed for hundreds of years. This was Eastern European pogrom. People were killed, property was destroyed, people looked on and didn't help. Thousands of people were uprooted. This was no longer a Germany that was recognizable. This was not from the 20th century. This was something different. This was a hark back to a terrible time that every Jew, if not every person, every civilized person hoped was in our past, this type of, of hate and vitriol. Susan, age 17, wrote, I was walking on the sidewalks with glass crunching under my feet. The next street, Fusanenstrasse, the oldest synagogue in Berlin was in flames. The entire sidewalk across from the synagogue was a carnival to the onlookers, applauding and laughing, flames lighting up the sky. All I wanted was just to get out, to get out. That's Susan, age 17. Came 1938. Uh, on the 9th of November, uh, all of a sudden, we had no idea. Uh, we smelt the uh, burning, and later on, we lived a little while, a little f uh, away from the synagogue. They destroyed the synagogue, they burned it down. And uh, they had to they had to bring in a certain amount of Jews. They had a quota. Every town, the Nazis did everything. Kedas and Kedin. You know, they had a quota. They had to bring in so many Jews from Fulda. And some of the Jews had had somebody tell them that there was going to be trouble. And they ran into the woods, including the rabbi. Uh, I was 16 years at the time. Um, all of a sudden, uh, the Nazis came and they ransacked the apartment. They threw everything down, the silver and the gold and everything that was in the apartment, out the window. And on the bottom of the, the bottom on the street, we were on the first floor, one flight up. And downstairs, on the, uh, on the street, were the Goetia women standing with their, um, what do you call it, the, the, the aprons, the big aprons there, and catching the silver and gold that was thrown out the window. The same women that put on the lights on burnt, the, 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 the same women were downstairs on the street catching it. People from my building, people that we were friendly with, people that we knew for 20, 30 years. Can you imagine how we felt? Nobody helped. Helped? No. We had a Catholic home across the street from our business. For when we knocked on the door on that 9th of November, they refused to open for us. And they were always friendly before. We will not, we will not help you, we cannot help you, you won't do anything for you. After they had thrown out all the belongings that were worthwhile, uh, others came and looked for me. I was taken in uh, that comes to, that now comes the very hard part. I was taken in and uh, was marched to an assembly pl a point where about 70 Jewish men were assembled. 
And on the way, there's people on both sides, Goyim, spat in my face, called, cursed and called all kinds of names. Uh, when we came to this assembly point, we were uh, marched off into a train, which was a cattle train, and we were sent to a town by the name of Hanau, which is closer to my grandfather's where he lived. There was the assembly, that was the, the big plan where the whole train was going to be sent to wherever we went. We didn't know at that time where, it's, where we were going to be. And there the whole district was assembled. Uh, when I walked in with the people from my hometown, my grandfather was there already. They had arrested him in his hometown. When he saw me... That was in Hano. In Hano, yeah. When he saw me, I'll never forget. His face turned white. He was a tall man. He bent over. On he was besides himself. I couldn't talk to him. I was on the other side. They wouldn't let us talk. All of a sudden, I see him, and they were assembled in a rows, standing. In the middle of the room was a table where the SS was sitting with lists, getting over the lists. All of a sudden, and the pistols were on the table. They had the pistols on the table. All of a sudden, I see my grandfather getting up, standing there and walking over to the table. He goes in his pocket, and he takes out his iron cross. That was his life. He said, um, I'm a hero from the First World War. I want you to send this boy home. He's only 16 years old. They looked at him. They gave him back the iron cross. They said, and they said, he's not going home, but you're going home. Because he had the iron cross first class, they released him. So, it's not what he really, what he wanted, but he had no choice. We were then assembled and in a cattle train was sent to Buchenwald from there. There are many reasons why this story is impactful, but the one I'd like to point out to you is that while all this was going on, as the Jews were formulating the responses, they grasped and they looked for any symbol, any source, anything that showed that it wasn't completely lost, that society wasn't gone. Here's an example. After Kristallnacht, after being spit at, after all that happened, they saw a glimmer, a glimmer of the old German, the glimmer of respect. Here, the grandfather couldn't save his grandson, but the Nazi had respect of sorts for that Iron Cross. It was part of the process of mixed messages that the Nazis have. When the main response, one of the main responses was after Kristallnacht in 1938, 40,000 Jews left, right? This is the highest number of the war. And again, the, the story of where and what the Jews where they went and how they survived is an interesting one, but one of their first responses to Kristallnacht was to get out. Things got worse after Kristallnacht. Jews were no longer to own businesses. It was called Aryanization. Nazis would walk in, take over a business, uh, take all the inventory, and then announce that now people could buy there because it was Aryan. Another major effort that deserves mention is the kinder transport. What happened to the children?
imagine what it would take for a parent, the desperate feelings, the desperate reality the parents were facing to put a two-year-old, a three-year-old child on a train by themselves without an older sibling, to go to a place that they didn't know, to a family they didn't know, really to a future they didn't know because the unknown future still seemed better than the reality that they were facing. We have, uh, we're running out of time. So where did the people go? They tried to immigrate, like we saw 40,000 people. Many went, tried to get to Palestine, but the doors were closed. Many tried to get to the United States, but the doors were closed. My family, the picture of my grandmother and grandfather that you saw at the beginning of the presentation, they ended up going to Shanghai. And this is a picture of a communal Shanghai residence called the Haim, where the, you had maybe 10, 20, 50, up to 100 families in some of them who they were only separated by sheets and they had to go from living in, in lives of dignity in Europe to China where the weather was different, the diseases were different, the food was different, the language was different in the ghetto. There was also suicide. It was inconceivable for many Jews to live in a world where a country could go from the heights of democratic experiment of the Weimar Republic to the depths of the Nazi brutality. And here you have famous authors, artists, musicians who took their lives. And here you see just one statistic. In 1941, 250 Jews were buried following suicide. In 1944, 42, 811. Okay, now I will do my best if you like. I will, I will try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, so um, we do have a few questions that popped up in the chat while you were giving your lecture. Thank you very much, first of all. So um, let's get to the question. So question was, um, why did Hitler, I guess when naming the Nazi party, why did he include the term national socialism? Um, if you could answer. National socialism was in reference to a particular economic model right, where it, it, it was a model that took responsibility, if you, if you will, for all elements of society. National socialist, what does that mean? It means that it, it, was, it, it was ideally a state, for example, that would give you a job. They, they, would, they gave you a vacation, if you remember the party. In other words, they instituted on an economic level, very attractive policies that impacted on the entirety of society. And that's that's the national socialist part. Okay, all right, um, thank you. Okay, so the next question I saw was, uh, you mentioned that German youth were burning things as a part of the Nuremberg laws in 1935. Um, what were they burning? Were they burning Jewish items? Were they burning other things? Wait, you mean the big picture of the bonfire there? Yeah, that was books. Those were Jewish books and it was the University of Berlin. And they, the Nazis asked the students to bring books that they felt were not Germanish in the sense of, of being the type of society. So anything, Freud, uh, Marx, uh, any social commentary, and even non-Jews, Goethe, right? The, anyone who represented an idea that was not what the Nazis wanted to, to, to pursue was burned, right? And the Nazis, right, God willing, there'll be a time soon where you can come back to the museum in Israel in Yad Vashem, but there's an exhibit in the museum that shows the price the Nazis were willing to pay in order to disenfranchise the, some of the greatest minds in the world if they were Jewish. So they were burning books. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have a question about the story with the grandfather with the Iron Cross. Do we know if the grandfather survived since he was no, like, he did oh, not. Hmm? he did not. He did not. Okay. Um, that's sad to hear. Um, why did the Jews of Germany think of themselves German Jews first, but not Jewish Germans? Why so German? <laughs> okay, so 
uh, that well there's i only if i speak for four or five hours <laughs> will i touch a fraction of what's written that's a fantastically interesting question and it has to do with the history of the jewish people it has to do with the history of the jews in europe it has to do with the enlightenment it has to do with the desire of Jews to be good citizens and simply waiting for a country that will allow it. It's a complex question. It's, it has to do with the ability the Germans allowed Jews to have in pursuing income, parnosa, uh, you know, a, a steady income. And, and these are all complex issues that existed long before the Nazis, but came to fruition before the Nazis. It's an interesting thing, I'll tell you. My grandmother, Oma, lost everything. She lost her mother, father, all her sisters, her brothers, her nieces, her nephews, her home, the family business. She lost everything. And they ran away the day after Kristallnacht, like criminals. They ran through Austria and up through. Yet when she would speak about Germany, her eyes would light up. She spoke about a country that was just, she couldn't believe it. It was magnificent in every way. The music, the, the, the literature, the sophistication. She loved being German. And that was part of the issue. The, she, she used to tell me that it was hard for her to mourn her mother because she never saw her mother die. Her mother had a life. She lived and had music and had telephone and had all sorts of affectations of civilization when they left to go to China. And then she was sent to Theresienstadt and she died there. It's a whole area, a very interesting area of study and, you know, uh, uh, maybe in the future. <laughs> okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Um... Is there evidence that the staged increase in organized anti-Semitism by the Nazis from 1933 to 1938 was pre-planned or did the Nazis ramp it up as much as they did population would tolerate? All right, so it's a very good question. The fact of the matter is we tend to think of the Nazis, you know, as German, as organized everything that they did from the day one until it wasn't like that at all. It was taking advantage of the situation. It was, look, they didn't like the Jews. They hated the Jews. They wanted the Jews out. But how that unfolded was opportunistic, was unorganized, was different in different places. There was never a unified German approach other than hating Jews. And that phenomena of sort of people pursuing a goal in their own way. That existed through the ghettos. Ghetto, every, ghettos were different. There was 1,500 ghettos. Everyone was different. Some were walled, some weren't, some were, right? Camps were run differently. The Nazis did not have unified policy that they followed in lockstep, contrary to the way we think. It was an unorganized, messy process that we suffered from continually and repeatedly. So everybody, thank you very much. Again, look next for week. the yeah, look for the invitation to next week's lecture, which you mentioned, uh, uh, Theresienstadt. It will be on that the ghetto camp uh, outside of Prague. A lot of thank yous in the chat for the wonderful lecture. Also. After next week, we've reached the midpoint with five lectures, and we will be sending out to you um, um, a form that you can fill out and answer questions questions and evaluation. So we want to get your opinion. We always do that when we have seminars. We're going to do one midway point and one at the end. So you'll look for that after next week's presentation. And that's it. Be in touch with any comments you have or questions. And Lori signing off. And we look forward to seeing you all again next week. All right. Thank so you thank again you for coming. Thank you so much for joining today. And thank you, Rabbi Cohn. Very My much. pleasure. Thank you, Lori. And thank you, Dorit. That's Dorit up there. She makes all this stuff happen.